Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar. Uh, today we'll be covering uh, keeping, uh, your keeping your business secure online. online. Uh, we'll be running our webinar from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. today. You should hear audio now. If not, uh, please dial in. And uh, more importantly, um, we have an option for some questions in the control panel. You should have a control panel in your screen there for yourselves, and you can uh, jump in with us and uh, ask a few questions. I know a few folks had some difficulty um, getting that second email or this last email from an hour ago, so I'm, I'm kind of seeing if people are still logging in here. I just sent another notice on that, but I um, want to welcome you. My name is Dave Kyle. I'm here with Matt. Welcome, Matt. Good afternoon, everybody. We are uh, with Ease Technologies, and we'll be presenting uh, our, our program for you today. If at any time during the program you don't have access to the control panel or have a question, you can easily reach me at dave at easetech.com, and I'll, I'll check on that during the program. So let's quickly talk about our agenda, Matt. I um, want to cover a few things about some uh, cyber threat examples, get into a little bit specifically about social engineering, which is kind of our major topic, and then talk about current small and medium business issues that are surrounding this topic, and most importantly, what you can do uh, to help protect yourself in some of these areas. So many of you are very familiar with a lot of the more known situations from organizations like Home Depot, uh, Microsoft, eBay, Target. What are some of the ones that kind of stand out in your mind, Matt? Yeah, I, I think the uh, Office of Personnel Management, the OPM, one is probably the most current one in the news today. It seems to be getting worse by the day, um, but uh, that certainly has uh, affected a lot of people who not only currently work for the government, but have applied for either security clearance or applied to work. So, so yeah, I think the, the, the total number is up to about 24 million people. And, and we do this webinar about once every three months, and uh, we always have a story to talk about. Yeah, it always, always changes. <laughs> so those are the kind of the, the, the bigger uh, cyber attacks and breaches that are out there. And there are, every, there are a lot of them, too, are like Target and Home Depot are for point of sale systems as well. So it's not just personal information. It's not just uh, financial uh, situations like at a bank. It's actually uh, personal and point of sale and a wide range of hacks that are going on out there. And not just online. I mean, it, it, it affects people that use the credit card in the store as well. So right. it's not just shopping online. At the, the we're going we're to focus mainly, mainly on small and medium-sized businesses, which is exact, some examples here as well. And uh, some of these um, companies you see up on the screen here, you may or may not have heard of Hershey Park. Um, That's a new one, right? Yeah, it was like uh, just a few weeks ago, their point-of-sale system got compromised. Well, but well, things well. like the, the Tennessee Electric and uh, the the police department there and the city of Poughkeepsie, these were um, wire transfer heists. And um, we'll explain what that is, how that compromise occurs, and, and give you some information how to keep yourself better protected. But um, as it's mentioned by uh, Representative Chris Collins, cyber attacks on small businesses are rarely, rarely make the headlines. So it is easy for these business owners to be lulled into a false sense of security. And I think you and I have seen a lot of that lately, and more so in the last two years, been hearing more about these types of compromises. And I think even some, some folks we work with or close to hear about some, some specific situations in our region. Absolutely. And, and there's just been more and more stories on the news. Uh, I, I actually I wrote down one when I was watching a news story on, on I think it was the OPM hack, uh, where it said 78% of organizations have experienced at least one data breach in the last two years, and that's regardless of size. And that's that's a huge number. And and if 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 you feel like you're lucky enough to be in that 22% who haven't, <laughs> then great. But the likelihood is you just don't know. Right. There's a lot of things going on out there. Right. Very scary. So why are um, why is small medium sized business a target, and not just the big big organizations? Um, mostly we've seen it because they have limited expertise. Staff is not necessarily trained on how to overcome these issues or, or protect themselves. Generally, there's fewer policies and procedures. You know, the, the idea, idea of a small and medium-sized business is that they're nimble, but that also is some of their weakness and what happens uh, and why some of these cyber attacks happen on small and medium-sized businesses. And what we've seen a lot of, and I'll share with you, is that they are gateways to other businesses. Some of the other attacks that are happening, they end up being the first prime target to go after a larger target and a larger business. And quite frankly, the, the small and medium-sized businesses just turn out to be easier, softer targets to go after. 
And, and as we'll see as we go through some of these examples, they may not even be the ultimate target. Right. They're, they're just using it as a gateway to get to that exactly. larger organization. So currently, we, we, and we've done a really good job over the last 10 to 15 years as, as a small, medium-sized businesses. We work with a lot of them. That's one of our, our prime targets. So we work with and help out. And, and you know, people have firewalls. They have antivirus protection, any malware, spam filters. And they do a good job at patch management. So all those things are in place, and yet we're still seeing more and more cyber attacks happen out there. Um, to explain kind of what's going on and what's been happening more recently or than not is, I kind of use the example here of this movie, Ocean's Eleven. And uh, and even goes back to uh, older cons that are out there. Ocean's Eleven, Matt, is a movie, you know, you've probably seen it, but it's... Uh, a lot of big name actors, and uh, it's all about uh, Andy Garcia, who is a manager of a casino, and uh, this other gang of thieves out there trick him and his employees into, into robbing the, the casino. So it's basically a con movie, just like some older movies out there, like The Sting or some other uh, con type movie out there. And social engineering from computer systems is the same kind of thing. Social engineering is a psychological manipulation of people in performing actions or divulging con confidential information. And that's what, you know, these cyber thieves are doing. They're, they're tricking people into divulging information and then going after and either taking personal information or a way for them to financially get some gain out of the situation as well. So the question becomes, and I often ask is, why does it happen? Hi, this is John from the corporate office with Starbucks. Hi, how are you? Oh, pretty good. We, I was just calling. We, we were having problems with uh, people calling in and pretending they're the corporate office, and we just wanted to let you know that if anyone calls in and says they're with the corporate office, just not to give them any information and not to believe them. Cause, okay. Because apparently people have been calling in and, you know, just, just making prank calls, I, I assume. Okay, great. Okay, and, and who's this? Okay, I'm, thanks for letting us know. Sure. Who's this I'm speaking with? And their, your last name? R E M O N T. Okay, and um, what's your employee number? Or, or I guess we could look it up by your cell phone number, whatever phone number's on file with us. Um, wait, you just want my partner numbers? Uh, sure. One, three. Okay, but do you have a phone number? Because that, that's the easiest way to look up your file here. Uh, six, eight. And, and you remember that part where I, I said uh, I said not to give out personal information to anyone pretending to be the corporate office? Yes. Why did you just give me all that? I don't know. I, I'm, I don't a prank, know. I'm a prank caller. <laughs> because... That was uh, something I found on YouTube. Um, and it kind of shows just how easy it is out there to trick people into divulging information. Um, this particular YouTube movie or, or video that was on there was actually about five or six different yeah. conversations that this guy had been doing, calling up Starbucks. If it was only the only example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately, it wasn't. There's quite a few out there. <laughs> so obviously, the phone is one mechanism that uh, people use, We're, and there, there are many other out there. Uh, email is a very common one. We'll, we'll explore that one here in the next 45 minutes. Thumb drives is another uh, example, and I'll talk about that. Social media. Phone calls and dumpster dives uh, is another one. And, and dumpster dives, what do I mean by that, Matt? Uh, it's it's old-fashioned garbage picking. I mean, it's it's really, you know, making sure that uh, you've shredded your documents because there are people out there that go through the trash looking for credit card numbers, social security numbers, anything that can make them, give them enough information to pretend to be you. Right. Or even, in some cases, get enough information to get more information right. from you. Yeah. Just give it just get enough to have that authority to say, give me more. Yeah, I think what's really fascinating is that, you know, some of these, these are the tried and true tricks that people have been using for over 100 years, but right. there's a lot more tools available now in the cyber world. So let's just talk about a few terms, not to get too techy with everyone, but uh, malware is a term will often be used through our conversation and you should hear about it. And basically malware is just a broad, overwrite, over broad term describing um, you know, software that is programmed to be hostile to your computer. You've probably all heard of a virus. That's a little more specific in how it acts and functions on your computer. Spyware is another very specific type of tool that's used. can't be seen, but it's a software that may be installed to watch what you're doing. A key logger is used one in a lot of wire transfer heists. Again, very specific malware 
that's used to record your keystrokes. This is very important in a wire transfer heist because they want to record your passwords. And this is what they'll do. They'll install a key logger onto your, your computer to record keystrokes. Phishing is a term that we use here a lot. It's a very broad term about um, going after people in a way so they can get in, gain information from them. There's another term called spear phishing, and that's a very targeted approach to going after a, an individual or organization. So let's get into some examples of what's going on out there. Um, the Stuxnet virus is actually kind of timely this week with the uh, Iran agreement that's been struck. Uh, but the United States and Israel back in 2007 uh, took on Iran's nuclear program through the use of a virus and uh, a worm that they installed on some thumb drives. And what they had done was they installed them on thumb drives and threw them out in the parking lot. So when the employees came to go to work, they picked up the thumb drives, put them in the computer, and the virus was installed into the computer. And at that point, uh, this particular virus was one of the first known uh, physical attacks, not just a software attack, but took the specific hardware that the centrifuges were using to create the uranium that was used for the nuclear uh, centrifuges and actually spun them up about a thousand times faster than they were supposed to operate and then broke the systems themselves. So it was kind of a pretty clever idea. This was this came out about uh, 2010. It was divulged in the, uh, I think the Wall Street Journal that this was an attack that the U.S. and Israelis had done. But I just wanted to demonstrate there's many different ways this is accomplished, and it's not just through email. And the lesson here is if you find a thumb drive, <laughs> yeah. don't go, oh, I wonder what's on this thumb drive. Right. Just yeah. throw it away. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't need it. It's not for you. That's right. Share another one with you as well. Uh, I kind of like this one. It was another um, a TED talk that I came across. In the summer of 2008, a country that shall not be named received a phone call from the Chinese government advising them against receiving His Holiness the Dalai Lama on an upcoming state visit. There was only one problem. The visit was secret. How could the Chinese have known? Well, the Dalai Lama turned to this team from the Information Warfare Monitor, the best of its kind, to help find the mole and neutralize the threat. And while James Bond had Q, who gave him the laser watch and, of course, the exploding pen, this team had Palantir. We gave them the ability to make sense of vast amounts of data and quickly differentiate between friend and foe. And what they found was truly amazing. The Dalai Lama did have a mole, but it wasn't human. They had been successfully targeted by Chinese spies, cyber spies. Using a technique called spear phishing, the Dalai Lama's computer infrastructure had been infected with a virus that gave the adversary control over their machines. So you may be familiar with phishing. This is the indiscriminate emailing of millions of people in the hopes of getting a few poor suckers to give up their login credentials. Spear phishing, as the name implies, is much more targeted. The adversary will research you, your interests, your friends, your behavior, and craft an email that plausibly comes from someone that you know. This email will have an attachment, a Word doc, or a PDF file. You'll open it, and you'll have been spear phished. The adversary now has control over your computer, which they can use to, for example, turn on your webcam to literally see and hear what you're saying in your office, send email to anyone as if they were you, and even exfiltrate data right off of your computer, including, as in this case, the Dalai Lama's negotiation position vis-a-vis -vis China, a very useful thing to have if you're the Chinese. Think about how much spy tradecraft has changed. If James Bond wanted to steal a dossier, he'd have to come crashing through the front door in his Aston Martin, wrestle some man-eating worms, break some gorgeous girl's heart, grab the goods, and get rescued by the CIA. These guys literally took the goods while sitting at home in their pajamas. But the already intriguing plot actually thickens. So the good guys, armed with a heroic amount of Red Bull, shaken, not stirred, uncovered a vast network of 1,300 computers in 103 countries that had been infected. The preponderance of these infections were against targets with interests in South and Southeast Asia, both countries and companies. This network, dubbed the GhostNet, had been active for two years and was highly active until the team made its existence public. So, as you can see, the face of espionage has changed. As recent events with Google have highlighted, the adversary targets both countries and companies. 
for both political and economic gain. Your automated intrusion detection systems and firewalls can't keep them out. The adversary is patient and adaptive, and most importantly, targets the weakest part of your network, humans. So the next time you get an email with an attachment, beware, there just might be someone sitting on the other end in their bathrobe, eagerly trying to steal your most sensitive IP. Don't bother calling James Bond, call on the cyber spies. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting, something that came across a couple years ago that uh, really stands out today is kind of where we're at and what's going on. Um, again, there's many different organizations have many different compromises that are happening to them, but I want to speak specifically to small and medium business threats. Um, the four that stand out that I've seen are bank wire transfers, ransomware, intellectual property, and vendor targets. Um, let's just talk about vendor targets and what I mean by that something you brought up earlier, Matt, which is kind of something we've seen in the last couple of years where they know the weak point of the network is maybe not the, the group they want to go after. The weak point is, is on the edge. Right. And the edge may be someone they work with. It may be an individual. It may be a vendor. And in this case, it's something they, they think may be trusted. And the same tactics are used. They'll use some phishing techniques. They'll use some of the mechanisms we saw. And they'll gain access to uh, someone who may be a vendor or another party that go, lets them get in the door to the main target they want to go after. So in the Home Depot one, were you familiar with, you were familiar with that one, right? Yes. That was essentially the idea that, you know, one of the vendors that worked at Home Depot had access to the computer systems. They compromised that vendor and then got into the uh, point of sale systems. In the case of the OPM hack, which is just something that happened and announced, um, well, it happened in the last, or the last eight or nine months, but it was announced in the last month is that you know, 24 million user uh, accounts were compromised uh, out of the Office of Personnel Management. What ended up happening was those servers were being hosted in the Department of Interior. They were in, OPM wasn't even hosting their own servers. And they targeted the uh, Department of Interior, and through a couple different mechanisms and techniques, they got into those databases that were over in the Department of Interior, then ultimately got them in, into the, you know, the OPM databases. So again, well, I think one one thing to just point out here, which we've kind of talked about, but not directly, is that the the examples that we keep talking about are, are nation states. These right. aren't these aren't just you know kids in their in their in their house trying to steal from right. people. These are actual countries that are that are behind this now. So it makes it even that much harder. Right. The the financial ones seem to be they seem to have their own flavor. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Notice that too. Yeah. <laughs> and again, we're just going through what we've been reading, what we've been researching, and, and particularly going after the last two or three years and, and kind of getting deeper into what's going on with some of this. Um, and we do it a little bit ourselves too, but uh, we have some adversaries that come after us directly in some ways. Sure. Uh, Medium-sized businesses have a couple countries that are very specific about targeting th those size organizations and their approach. Um, I'm going to switch over to ransomware. And, and you may have heard about this particular type of malware attack. It's called ransomware. It's particular software. It's called CryptoLocker or CryptoWall. It was started about uh, almost two years ago where it came out of Ukraine where a package of malware was created that ends up through a phishing attack. It encrypts your hard drive. You get this message that you see up on the screen and it tells you that you, know, you need to pay this particular uh, bank thir thir only $300 and they'll encrypt your hard drive. Now, I just read an article that 40% of everyone's been paying the money. So basically, really? yeah, pretty high number. <laughs> that is much higher than I expected. Yeah, they figured they're getting about $30 million every three months. And about 0% about of those people got actually got the key? Uh, I don't, don't know that answer, <laughs> but the problem is, is that, like you said, even if you pay the money, there's no guarantee that your hard drive will then become unencrypted. Right. So the way we end up having to solve this is we have to wipe someone's hard drive completely and go to a backup and restore what they've had. Uh, and there's some real complications with this. Um, the, the, the crypto locker malware itself sometimes lays in wait for several days. Um, we can re extract some information when we have to go through a hard drive. We can't necessarily get it all. Um, we, we, we have to find the date before that malware was in, in, installed on that computer. Right. So, You've got to make sure that your backups are good for maybe maybe several weeks. Right. So it's it's really critical to have that good backup disaster recovery solution in place. And, and this is probably a good point to explain kind of why and how some of these things happen. Um, 
you know, again, people use malware, you know, protection, you know, have firewalls, all these tools out there to help keep themselves protected, and it's still these things get through. To kind of kind of make it brief is basically there are exploits that are uncovered, and those exploits are, are sometimes then announced, and um, they're announced to the public. The software developers know about them, and they start trying to work and create a fix. And that's where you see security patches, security updates come out. But during that time, there's a window that's left open. And it could be hours, days, and in some cases, weeks, where the software developers don't patch those exploits that are, are openly disclosed. That's when the cyber hackers come in, and through phishing attacks, typically, they'll push out a bunch of emails with malware attached, and get through the door that way through social engineering techniques. So, it's, you know, you may have really good patch management, updates being done, things like that. This is where the social engineering tactics are being used to push themselves through onto your computer and install these key loggers and other right. malware to get into your system. And it only takes one person to make a mistake right. to compromise a whole organization. Right. So it's really critical. It's, it's critical just to educate people about this to make sure that, you know, they're verifying before they're acting. Right. Um, let's talk about another example. This is, again, a larger organization, but it shows you kind of the steps that happened here. This was a board member at Alcoa. Uh, his email was uh, compromised. He was going to be attending a meeting, so um, there was an email sent out with the agenda attachment for an upcoming meeting. And in that agenda attachment was actually malware. This got sent out to about 24 people. He was trusted, so the email was opened. The malware attachment, which was thought to be a, uh, I think a presentation, was downloaded, and then a whole bunch of executives had their computers compromised. At that point, the malware then did some other things and spread out through the Alcoa network. And um, the, the goal in this particular situation was uh, the Chinese had used this to uh, go after Alcoa and understand some more intellectual property about how they make steel. Uh, and this happened about a year ago. Again, just showing some of the techniques that are going on out there. Going back to a medium-sized business, uh, there's a certain uh, tactic that's being used in the last year called a masquerade attack. And what's going on is there's an impersonation of an executive, either a CFO or a CEO of a company, targeting the finance department, where they use a combination of email and a phone call. They create a sense of urgency to obtain access to get a wire transfer sent out. So what they do is they Again, spoof an email from uh, an individual, the, the president, CEO, or the CFO of the company. It goes to the finance department, and then a phone call comes in shortly thereafter and says, Hi, this is the president of the company. You just received an email from me. I'd like you to make sure you act on that wire transfer immediately. And in a medium-sized company, they might not know some of these people that are getting those emails from or the phone call. And because the phone call was there, the email was there, they're going to act accordingly. And there's been multiple instances weekly by the FBI reporting that this masquerading attack is going on, and medium-sized businesses are sending out thirty, fifty thousand dollars to the banks in the Caribbean. And we've actually seen this with a couple clients quite recently, um, where they're, they, you know, people are using the internet to to look up companies and organizations to find out the structure of the leadership. So. Once they do that, then they can create a spoofed email account where right. they learn the, the way the emails are set up. Um, so we, we have asked our clients to, to make sure that they put in some kind of check, even if it's a, you know, a phone call or two signatures before money can be released, right. that sort of thing, to help alleviate some of that. Here's kind of an example of that happening. Um, you've probably all heard about the Anthem attack and, and more locally the Care First uh, hyper cyber attack where um, this was a spear phishing situation where these three healthcare organizations probably I think it's pretty close to 90 million people were compromised in the situation um, personal information was obtained some of these hacks uh, obtained social security numbers some of them did not what the technique that was used here was uh, spoofed domain names so you'll see here that I have care first written on the second bullet item but it's care first with an exclamation point. What these, um, and then again, they're pointing back to the Chinese on this one. It doesn't really matter what country it's from. It's just, you know, this is where they're originating. Um, this particular case is they created spoofed uh, sites using, you know, domain names that weren't real, but close enough that when the emails went out, people logged in and gave their authentication information thinking it was the uh, 
the real name of the organization. So Anthem, Primera, and Care First, they looked on some of the records. There was probably 20 to 30 different spoofed um, domain names that were out there uh, that the folk, fake websites were created and then you know authentications and credentials were cre um, gathered in that manner. Let's take a look at some of these emails that are used in this manner. Um, this is one I, I, I gathered a few. We all get them. I screen captured a few of them here for us. So this one was uh, caught my attention because the sender was from AT&T voicemail. I don't get emails from AT&T, so right away, you know, flag went off. Um, well, even if you did get a, a, <laughs> an email from your voicemail system, why would it be going to multiple people? Exactly. <laughs> you know, here's five people that received this, so that's a problem. Uh, also within there was a, a, a zip file, which is a, a big flag in itself. And then looking at the email itself, Matt, there was a variety of flaws with what was in there. It was, it was 2014 when I received it. The date at the bottom was 2013. It talked about if you wanted to contact us, you can reach us here. And there was no information. So again, there's a lot of, you know, probably was a screen capture they had done and used it in some manner, but there was a lot of missing information. But, but notice from the logo and from everything else on there, it looks legitimate. If you don't pay attention, you, you could easily be fooled into thinking that was a legitimate email. Uh, here's one from last week, as a matter of fact. I, I took interest to this one because, not that it was from last week, but I noticed that um, my wife works for a Fortune 500 company. I have two other friends that are attorneys. We were talking about this on Saturday night, and I was talking about this particular email that I got, and they all mentioned they had gotten it as well. So this spam email, you know, phishing expedition went out on the 6th, right after an announcement of an exploit in Flash. So I'm, I'm kind of tying the two together that that window was left open in Flash. Here's an exploit that went out uh, of notice, and then the spam and, and phishing expeditions follow up shortly thereafter. So this email was uh, correct in who it went to, didn't know who it was sent. It, I don't recognize the email address, but it talks about a wire transfer. So clearly the, this email was targeting someone in a, in a financial department, hoping they'd click on that attachment even though it was a doc file, probably wasn't a doc file, it was an attachment of some type that contained malware. And didn't get, did not get picked up by... And, and yeah, that's the big message here. It did not get picked up by many people's spam filtering, which is kind of a, a little bit of concern. Again, we have these things in place, we use them as well, and it got through a lot of systems. Well, you, you have to have them as the basic right. level of, of security, but it's not the end-all, be-all. Hmm. This one got my attention. I got this one last fall. I thought it was a little, little more clever and something I've seen in the past. Um, typically, they all have bad spelling and you know a lot of a lot of information that's incorrect. This one was really pretty good, in that the uh, had a good email address that it was going to with someone in our company. Um, there was an attachment to it which caught my eye, but was kind of interesting about it was that there was a sense of urgency created here. This particular email came in at, at um, five o'clock in the evening. And then the message in there says things need to take place before 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. So, again, it came from a bank. My guess is the, the intention here was to create this sense of urgency that someone leaving at the end of the day gets this email, needs to act on it quickly. And instead of just waiting for tomorrow morning, they'll just click on that attachment. By clicking on that attachment, that's when all things, all bets are off at that point. Um, that's when the malware would have been installed for that individual. Again, phishing expedition. This particular one was from a... The area code was from the state of Washington, but uh, you know, people in the state of Washington may, you know, be working with this particular bank and could have sensed that they needed to click on it and respond accordingly, and would have been a compromise at that point. You know, with with a couple of examples that you've shown here, uh, I think two of them had the zip files as yeah as the, the the thing, and that for anybody that doesn't know is is a is a is a way to to compress multiple documents into one thing. Um, so if you're getting something that is compressed a zip file in your email and you're not expecting it from somebody, maybe be, be a little skeptical, right. maybe run it through a, a separate, uh, malware or uh, antivirus scan before you open that. And again, the message here in this one as well is paying attention to what you're getting, but also read it through before you just start and, clicking on and things. You, uh, common sense goes a long way. Yeah. So let's talk about the wire transfer heist, which is probably the, the biggest compromise that's going on out there today for small and medium-sized businesses. And, and it's, it's significant because some of the amounts that are being taken, 
could really take a company out, quite frankly. Uh, you look at these companies were $327,000, $440,000. Here's the city. They've lost $378,000. And this um, Luna and Luna, which is an escrow company, had $1.2 million compromise in them. And the, the, generally, the technique is it's either it's phishing or spear phishing, targeted or, or broad. And malware is installed. And particularly what they're doing is these key logging malware, which is a, it's a bundle of, of software. It's not just one piece of software. It's multiple packages of software they're creating. Um, they sometimes buy these on the black market. They don't write their own code, and they assemble them and then put them in a package and, and, and go after it uh, in that manner. So let's talk about a wire transfer heist. Let's talk about this particular organization. It was a hospital out in uh, Washington, and what happened to them? They kind of dissected the situation so you ha we have some details. So hackers first started off <clears throat> by creating a relationship and hired a bunch of home workers in the state of California. They hired about 100 individuals to work from home, claimed that they were going to pay them. And in doing so, for them to get paid, they needed to establish a banking wire transfer system between the company and the home workers. Obviously, they didn't <laughs> divulge themselves as being hackers. They had a, right. a fake company, but they now had a wire transfer system in place to transfer money between home workers and the company they established. And those home workers feel like they're working for a legitimate company. Right. They so, figure they're going to get, right. you know, may have gotten laid off, right. need some money, wanted to work from home. Sure. Great. Have an opportunity to do that. Next, the hackers identified either through uh, spear phishing or phishing tactics. They wanted to go after uh, certain organizations. They uh, created their malware and then established that malware in the hospital. In this case, they uh, were able to uh, strike at the hospital by installing uh, key loggers. Again, there's malware that would record the keystrokes in the financial department. Once that was done, they gained access and had all the information they needed to do to get into the U.S. banks. Once completed there, they started transferring small amounts of money. And this is another important flag to look for. About $10 to $50 was the initial flag that went off. And uh, that's a, a really important one to watch out for. You can get this far. When I mean, you start seeing small transactions of $10 or $50 going through outside your the banking system, they don't know where it's going. It's a big flag to look, look for what's going on next. Then the course of the weekend, uh, the next steps took place, which is the money was then transferred. There's about $1.2 million uh, that got uh, taken from the hospital. That was sent to these home workers in $10,000 increments and then went to Ukrainian banks. Um, so it was an elaborate con here and scheme and well thought out, took many months to do. But, you know, they found a way for themselves to get their hands on about $1.2 million dollars. And, and just like the gentleman in the TED Talk described, these people are, are patient and in for the long play. This is a perfect example of that. Yeah. This is this is something that happens over a, a large amount of time. And and like Dave just described, seeing those small transactions early gives you the ability to question them, put a freeze on accounts, and really start putting some things in place that just to, to stop that. Some of the point of sale system compromises that we've seen with like Target and some of the other ones. Uh, where they've stolen credit card numbers, they're doing the same type of thing. They're mm -hmm. they're they're testing the credit card numbers yep. that that they buy with very small transactions, maybe sometimes as low as five dollars, just to see if they're legitimate numbers that will go through and work. And once they've established that, then right, then sky's the limit. So let's talk about some lessons learned in some of these situations. So you have some important information you can take back to your 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 office or even for yourself personally. In the case of the wire. Uh, bank wire transfer heist, uh, one of the things that really comes out and stands out as a, as a best practice to follow is make sure you're using a de dedicated banking computer. What I mean by that is using a computer that doesn't have an email attached to it at all. Right? So don't use Outlook on this computer. All of its sole purpose is, is to access your bank, um, You know, even to the point where maybe it's a Macintosh computer or something that's not as easily compromised. Um, having good password policies, which we'll share with you in a minute. Make sure you have clear bank transfer notices and working with your bank on that. Looking for those small transactions that I explained to you. And then also, as Matt described, these can be long plays. So being careful and diligent every day as to what's going on with those notices, you'll have a better understanding and you'll be better equipped to understand what's happening there. Yeah. And um, before we get into the password policies, there there is uh, some new things that I've personally been seeing both at my home and, and my wife's office 
uh, in terms of a new method that people are using is we've been getting phone calls uh, that claim to be there from Microsoft um, and they know that we have uh, a virus that are on our computer and they want us to log into a specific website so they can help clean us, uh, clean the computer off. And then alternatively, we've gotten calls that claim to be, uh, you know, uh, have warrants out for arrests or money owed. And we, you know, again, they're trying to create that sense of urgency to make you do something that you wouldn't do. And what I, what I tell clients all the time is Microsoft is never going to call you ever. Nor, tell, nor the Windows company. Nor either. Windows, <laughs> nor Apple, nor, and no one is going to call you at your business and tell you that there's a problem with your machine. Right unless it's your IT vendor that you know and you recognize their voice, right. don't trust them. <laughs> right. So this is the, the, the big compromise that they go after and what they want to obtain from you is the password information that you have to get into the accounts they need to get to. So by following some of these policies, you're going to help mitigate the circumstances that are empowering them to get to the information they want. So the first one is that you make sure you're using long, complex passwords. I have an example of one up there on the screen. The two most common passwords that are still used out there by uh, everyone is uh, password and one, two, three, four, five, six. No, not change me. No. <laughs> that's probably three. <laughs> that's, maybe that's three. Um, the next is make sure you're using a passwords that are different between sites. Don't use the same password you use on Facebook that you use in your bank. Uh, and it seems obvious, but again, it, it's, it's really important that you use different passwords on different sites. Can't emphasize that enough. Because oftentimes what they're doing is they're taking the passwords they're obtaining in databases and they're keeping records of who they have, emails and passwords, and using them later on. There's been a couple situations where that's been uncovered. I think it was an Apple hack that happened that they, um, the Apple wasn't compromised, but the data and information from another website or another um, password and email combination was used to get into Apple because they had that data from right. another hack. And I believe it was a very simple password. Right. And, uh, frequent password changes. So if you're using banking information, you got to change your password three, every three months, every six months. But, you know, every year I go through and I look through my email and my passwords to make sure I've made some changes here along the way. One thing I've read recently, and we don't have it on here, is a lot of people, and I, I've done this myself, is uh, you, you use words and make, you may change the, the A to an at symbol right. or, or an E to a three. Uh, well, those are apparently very uh, much easier to crack than than something that doesn't, you know, translate into right. a word visually. So, so nonsensical words. Nonsensical nonsensical words. Well put. Um, we'll talk about a password manager in a second because as we're suggesting all this. You know, we, many of us have, and I know I have about 140 different passwords that I'm using. I can't remember them all. And they uh, are daunting to keep up with. So you need a tool to help you manage these passwords. We'll share some ideas for you on that. I, I could not live without a password manager at this yep. point. It's too, there's too many. <laughs> Auto locking your devices is really critical as well. Whether you have a, an iPad, an iPhone, uh, your laptop, your desktop computer, making sure those devices are auto locking is really important as well. And that actually turns on encryption on those devices. So once you enable auto lock on your mobile device, Android or iOS, the Apple ones, um, that actually encrypts the information on your device. So it's really key. Another uh, important thing to consider, and I know some of the banks are starting to do this now, is uh, using two-factor authentication. And we'll talk about that in our next slide. So two-factor authentication is another step, sort of a third, third way of recognizing you as an individual. So you have something that you know is your password. Something you may have, maybe your phone, is an extra code that you can have sent to you. Um, you, know, you may have seen these RSA token generators on the screen up there that many enterprise companies use, and it's a specific number that comes across that you have to type in to get access to the network. Well, many software companies provide what are called two-factor or multi-factor authentication methods through this way of sending a text message to your phone once you establish a relationship with them. So for working with Google Mail, very simple example, you can go into Google and turn on multi-factor authentication. You establish that your phone is your phone. And anytime you want, not anytime, but when you first start using your phone it'll or any other device, it'll want to have an, an extra factor of authentication, not just your name and password. It'll send you a text message to use that device to gain access to your account. 
And the nice thing is the code that, that they send you will expire after like 30 seconds. So once that's gone, then, you know, somebody can't get into your account or they would need to, they would need to regenerate that code through your phone before you can get back into that system. Let's talk about password managers. So Matt, you're using one. I'm using one as well. I am. But I have a, the last bullet item there are two that we're using right now uh, that I've familiar with. One is called 1Password. And basically what it allows for me to do is keep a, uh, on my iPhone, my iPad, and my Macintosh computer, I can keep uh, my passwords all managed from one spot. Uh, one of the first questions comes up, well, is that safe? <laughs> and Matt, how do you feel about it being safe? I mean, it's reasonably safe. They, I, I use one password as well, and the uh, the 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 key where it contains the database that has all the passwords in it is actually encrypted itself. I keep it uh, within Dropbox so I can sync it between all those devices. Um, so it, there's there's a couple level of encryptions. I mean, it's not a hundred percent, but I feel confident. Um, I know some people write down passwords in a notebook and things like that. Right. Um, you know, there, there's always some way for somebody to break in and get them. So uh, whether it's paper, whether it's electronic, you're never 100% secure. But I feel pretty good about, about these products. Right. I, 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 I do as well. Investigated this thoroughly. I know 1Password's a very good product. Um, you know. and I, I can't live without it. Right. You know, I actually have like two or three different emails and use them for different accounts, depending on whether it's personal or business. And then you talk about all the different passwords, 140 or so that I mentioned, right. there's no way to keep it all track. Exactly. So. Particularly if you're using the long, complex passwords that we want you to use. Right. So we had a question before um, we started our program that came in on an email about cloud computing. And is that safe? And is that a, a good way for people to try to, you know, keep themselves protected? And Matt, do you have some thoughts yeah. on that? Uh, I, yeah, I could spend an hour, but um, cloud computing means a lot of different things to different people, but there are some technical standards to look for. The ISO 20007 standard is kind of the, the highest level security standard for cloud computing. So if you're evaluating services, you want to make sure that you see that number. Um, but generally speaking, you know, having your server in an office, I mean, I, I've seen uh, I've seen people break into offices to steal servers and computers and leave everything else alone. So having your having your information inside an office is not secure. Um, having a private cloud, I would think, is, is actually more secure. Right. Um, so in, in a lot of ways, um, like I said before, nothing's 100 percent. But in a lot of ways, cloud computing is more secure than than having your information inside your office. Especially for many small and medium sized businesses. Absolutely. It's, it's very, much more affordable these days. Right. And it's very difficult to manage and, and keep up with all the patch management, security procedures. When you have these servers or your desktops even in the cloud, you have a way to have it much more securely protected and managed for yourself. Exactly. Talk about some mobile safety. Uh, Matt, you want to share with us some, some thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I would love to because I've been in hotels quite recently. Um, and, you know, I, I say this to a lot of people, avoid free Wi-Fi. If you, if you do need to connect to free Wi-Fi, be very cautious about what you're doing. Don't do online shopping. Don't do online banking while you're on free Wi-Fi. Um, there's a story I'd love to tell uh, about a year or two ago. A guy walked into a Panera uh, with his laptop, opened up his laptop and created a wireless uh, network from his laptop called Panera Wi-Fi, uh, which everyone started connecting to. And then he started using a keylogger to to basically collect the information uh, that was coming through his laptop to the Internet. Um, so it's just you, you want to make sure that you're connecting to what you think you're connecting to. If you're in a Starbucks or a, uh, a hotel you want to make sure there's some kind of splash screen that comes up that says, you know, you're connecting mm -hmm. to what you're thinking of. But be careful. So using a virtual private network software is one tool. We have another suggestion, too, which is, you know, uh, a tool which is called a software, which is called Find My iPhone. And I already mentioned auto device locking. So let's talk about Find My iPhone real quick. There's also a version of this for Android phones called Android Lost. But when you're out and about, um, you need to turn this on ahead of time. It's Find My iPhone. I've used it before. 
it enables you to, once your phone it may get lost, have a couple of control points for you to get that phone back. One is you have a, a way to log into your, uh, through a browser to see where your phone may be, provided it's still on. You have the ability to also send a lost mode, which is a message you can send to that phone and say, hey, look, if someone finds this phone, please let me know. And you can give another phone number, maybe a friend, your spouse may be with you, and you can have that phone then um, call you on that number and get connected. Or in worst case, the last thing you do is remotely erase the phone. So any personal information, financial information, anything you want, if you can't get that phone back, you can push the erase the iPhone button and it's gone at that point and right. all the data is wiped out. Right. And again, you want to make sure you have a good backup so you can download all that data and all those apps to a, to a different unit. Right. This is this is critical. We've actually recovered clients' lost iPads before by using this. Yeah. So it's not only is it is it a security feature, but it also can save your save your device. Yeah, I, I lost my iPhone in the golf course uh, about a month ago. It was two months ago, and uh, I did use my friend's iPhone who was who was with me in the cart, and I typed in, "Hey, give us a call on this number." And a few more holes later, someone found my iPhone and called me. So nice. It does work. Yep. Some analog safety we like to talk about, kind of revisiting the, the dumpster dive conversation we talked about earlier. Uh, again, watching out for phones, shredding as much information as you can. And uh, then just let me jump in. There's there's actually a cross cut shredder, so it doesn't just shred in uh, vertical lines. It actually cuts uh, diagonally in both directions, which apparently is the safest way to shred a document so that somebody can't put that information back together. Uh, there, people are very patient. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, we, we, we talk about these because we we know that there are situations, again, with phone, grabbing information out of trash cans um, that are used in combination with emails to uh, gain access to information they want or you want to use. I want to add one last slide in here that uh, I, I think is kind of important important because it does provide personal information. It doesn't fall necessarily in the small and medium business area, but so we are talking about keeping yourself protected is identity theft. And uh, I've been looking into a lot of information about this and, and come across a lot of different things and wanted to share just a few thoughts on this is personal identity typically involves the credit card information and more importantly, social security uh, numbers. Last year, uh, the FTC announced that there were about 10 million people a year were compromised with their identity. Uh, the tax refunds, there was about $5.2 billion that was taken out before uh, the tax refunds were uh, sent. Basically, what's going on is the identity theft. Uh, someone gains access to Social Security numbers and information, files a tax return before the individual does, and they get access to uh, that, the tax returns that they were fraudul fraudulently uh, sent in. The scary part about it all is that 32% of all compromises start and originate by a family member, so someone that you know, and even 18% by a friend or in-home employee, so someone, someone so that's, cleaning. That's half, half of them yeah. are somebody you know. Exactly. That's really, that's yeah. really something. So point being is you, know, you need to make sure that you um, keep your personal information well protected in your own home is what it comes down to. Yeah. Let's just share seven important steps to keep yourself protected online. We shared several of them, but just, just let's summarize them for you here. As Matt, you know, we said already, let's make sure we have regular backups. Keeping our devices updated with um, the latest security patches and malware and antivirus protection. Uh, following good password policies with your mobile devices and your desktop systems, make sure they're secure at all times. Following good mobile habits. Communicating clearly with your bank about steps you need to take to make sure your information is secure, two-factor authentication, and finally, um, a good notice. A good thing to do is getting credit card alerts from a personal standpoint as well. So, I did have a lot of questions come in already, and I kind of slid them in, and actually had a few ahead of time. So, if anybody has any questions right now, I'm more than happy to take them. Um, I do want to get wrapped up, as we said before. Um, we. I think the one question we did have was, um, is cloud secure? Now, another question, I think it may have happened, we may have answered already, is are, are, are those password managers secure? And to just expand on that a little bit, uh, we you know, one of the things we did mention was using Dropbox. Um, I do want to mention cloud and Dropbox scenario because it is important that um, 
you do you when you use the uh, services like Dropbox, um, you pay for the extra um, business features in there. So for example, like the Dropbox, I know many people are using Dropbox. You have a free version, not that it's insecure. It's just that the professional paid version is more secure. And I think it's about nine dollars a month. I think that. Yeah, I think so. And it, it just gives you more features in terms of being able to secure your data. So if even if you have an employee that leaves or you have to fire right. um, for whatever reason, you have the ability to pull back that data that's on their device or on their computer. So it it, it is, I mean that that security too. I mean, right. Like we just said, fifty percent are people that we know, and some of them could be people that you know we need to let go in our organization. So right. you want to make sure you have those tools available. Um, great. Just want to share with you again. Um, we are at Ease Technologies. We are founded in 1993. We're based out of Columbia. We provide IT services and secure cloud solutions to small, and medium-sized businesses in the region. Um, please feel free to check us out on our website. And I want to announce with you our next webinar in August will be August 26, where we'll be sharing a very similar format. We'll be talking about uh, productivity tips for using your iPads and iPhones in business. I'll be sending out some email invites for everyone who's attended this event, but you're more than welcome to share that and invite your other business associates as well. And I uh, just want to thank everyone for attending today. If you have any other questions, I did see there's some people had some issues trying to get in and log on. Um, I'll, we did record this. I'll send out the um, uh, information about the recording. I'll share it with everyone. I see there's another question came in. Um, the question is, the security, the secretary in our office surfs the net all day. Would this be a risk for our company? The answer would be yes. Um, yeah, you don't know where that secretary is going, what they're clicking on. Uh, so, yes, it could be. Yeah, most of the compromises um, come in from the people who are least informed about how to deal with things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's not just the... The CIO, CEO, they're going after. They're going after anybody they can get to. Like in the situation of the Dalai Lama, they're going to get to somebody close to them, right. gain access, and then they're going to get to what they need to by a weaker point of entry. Right. So we, we have clients that we we use a, a cloud uh, service for that have completely eliminated their employees' ability to get to the web. So. All they can do is is work on what they need to work on, and, and obviously you can lock that down as much as you want or open it up as much as you want. It depends on your situation. Yeah, and there's also ways, too, and again, with some of the cloud services, you can separate them. They can be in a similar space but also be secure in exactly. some aspects, too. Yep. Um, you can read if any other questions. Please send them to Dave at EastTech.com. have a blog that we uh, do share with everyone with a lot of other tech tips. You'll be receiving an email uh, with a survey that we'll be asking for some feedback about our webinar. As I mentioned, this has been recorded, and I'll share a link for you with that as well. So, again, I want to thank you very much for joining us today, and um, catch you hopefully next month. Thanks, everybody.